If there are Indians, I believe we could see some support. Meanwhile, I think we must be willing to support it from the West. Now, let me give you another important answer to a tough question. They, we always have this trouble in the Middle East. The people ask, what are you doing here? Who pays you? According to Phil, and you have to do this in India before I can answer for India, these people accept you as a religious teacher. You're a religious teacher. You don't have to explain what you're doing. They have that. You see, if we understand more about Islam, we use their terminology, not our terminology. And, and we can't even do that now because we don't even know what their term, terminology is. And, and we bring this message to them in, in, you know, people say bring the gospel in India in an Indian teacup, an Indian cup. I heard that on the India film strip. Which Indian cup? You have two people, three people, how many people's groups, but you've got a, several groups that are absolutely at each other's throat, being killed every day in the Punjab. So I say, you know, it's got to get a little more define what kind of Indian cup? What kind of Indian meal? And some Indians have adopted well to North India and we commend them for it. But not many have been willing to adopt to Muslim, Islamic North India, different culture. Yes? Right now I can think of about three um, ex swimmers they're Muslim converts, and they're they're just floundering because they have no financial support. You know, they're just, you know, but if they had financial support, they would be thrilled, I'm sure, to go join the team and just give them, they, they're burdened for Muslims, they want to reach Muslims, but we have not had peace to support them because that was yeah. not OM policy. So we pushed them out of OM, they were on OM for two or three years, then we forced them out, and they're sitting at home or trying to get them a job. Uh, would you take one of those, two of those on the team? Yeah. I am, of course, open to this, but I think we have to understand we are talking about a very new approach to Muslim, and some of the strongest opposition could come from very narrow-minded Muslim converts who are, uh, you know, totally unwilling for any kind of what they will call compromise. So number one, we've got to get a team leader. And that team leader, the others, have to be willing to follow what's on his heart. Just as over there, Hebel is teaching all the missionaries. All the missionaries that come, Hebel teaches them, also helps them learn Bengali. So what I'm saying is these people must be of one heart and one mind. If you go into church planning without a small team of one heart and of one mind, you are going to have an interesting time. You'll be wishing for the day you were selling gospel packets. Remember, I'm still basically a gospel packet man. You know, I know my limitations. <laughs> so they've got to be a like-minded group. Now, I have this little burden for the Lucknow training program that we could have some kind of Islamic training program incorporated into Lucknow so that before they go out to that village 100 miles away town, that they all have to go through this course where we find out if they're like-minded. We cannot all run out there all doing different things. Now, of course, there'll still be plenty of variety. And some days, Bill Bushel, as a foreigner, dresses just as the Muslim, and Hebel puts on his Western clothing. <laughs> I mean, Hebel is Hebel. So, of course, if you've got some quality people like Brother H from Bangladesh, let's get this, brother, and let's spend a lot of time with him. It takes time. That relationship with Hebel, Bill Parshall worked with him, Mike Life has been a major factor working with Hebel. This is, there's no shortcut to this. No shortcut. And this is why, you know, I want to go slow. And there's a lot of other things we can do in other places. Let's have experimentation. You do some experimentation. I think you've got a program in Bangalore. Praise the Lord. Would you please write down what you're learning through this, if you're learning anything, and get it back to me? and get it around to others. Now, we're hoping that Mike Hay is going to be one of the men to help coordinate this. And, uh, you know, I think as we meet as trustees, I'm just throwing this out. You know, we're going to come up with, with a training program that is going to prepare people for this kind of work, whether they stay with OM or not. And we will continue still with OM as, first of all, a training program. There are a number in this room I've talked to who even were thinking about leaving OM who are, who are very attracted to this 
approach. They didn't mind driving trucks a few years and uh, being a helper. They feel they need, they had so much to learn, but they want to sink their teeth into what they see as a long-term ministry. Remember also, if you learn the language, culture, and how to identify and work with people, you could also do this kind of work to some degree even back in the British Isles or in other countries. If you learn Urdu as a, fa a foreigner and you develop the ability to win Muslims to Jesus Christ, Mr. Wakeley has just walked in. Would you be willing to take any of these people possibly? You know, long-term leaders who speak fluent Urdu. Any opening in, in Bangladesh? I mean, in Pakistan? Yeah, you find an opening. <laughs> See, Urdu, I believe, in Hindustani, they're very linked. I, my phrases are Hindustani. I've got the Urdu now in my tape recorder and I'm trying conversion. I've got these Hindustani phrases so deep in my head I'm having trouble conversing. I've even been listening to them here in my Urdu. But whenever I go in the streets, I smile, they understand these few Urdu phrases. So a lot of the Muslims here are very much Hindustani. Some Urdu words. And I would recommend, of course, learning both languages, Hindustani and Urdu. And then also Pakistan will be ready for you, plus England and Urdu-speaking people, the Gulf, tremendous possibilities. But it, it is specialist work to some degree, to a large degree. <coughs> Let me say one thing. It's not new to missions. A high percentage of all missionary breakthrough and response has come from specialists. Men that just went there and they died there in that place until the church was born. <laughs> We're not talking about anything really new. But for Muslims, it, it never got to a very big stage. Though there are beautiful examples of men who've fallen into the ground and seen Muslim converts. So never, you know, let us not despise all that God has done in the past. Yes, Marcos. I actually praise God for this exhortation that you gave us this morning. Uh, for a long time, I never thought on this line. It also brings more on identifying with the Muslim community. Last year, in the summer, when we went up to Kashmir, uh, Sumshad and myself visited one brother <coughs> who came to the Lord in 1969 by going, uh, going around to shops and distributing. Praise the Lord. And uh, I also mentioned a uh, letter about this particular girl there. We had a long discussion with him and he mentioned one of the things that I just want to share with you. Maybe one of the questions will come out from that. He said his uh, discussions and time with few other Muslim converts both Chamsun and Mahmoud were there talking to his brother. Um, his discussions and you know, talking about this kind of work with few Muslim converts who are from other places, they had a meeting. He said it's really very discouraging from these Muslim converts because some of them really don't have the right answer. Uh, this is what I just want to share that this brother is doing great work in a very quiet way mm. among the Muslims in Kashmir and Sri Lanka. And uh, he in fact sent out cards to the officials in the ministry in Kashmir during Christmas and Easter time and all of time. Of course, they are also indirect way of communicating the gospel, you know. And uh, he was telling me that he in fact mentioned names like K. and uh, Emon Khan and few others and Yami Saman and all, you know. Some of them are actually poor examples for this kind of ministry. And few of them are no more in India doing anything. Mm. They had some vision, then they were spoiled by foreign funds and foreign influence. And uh, I, I'm not judging them. Yeah. But, uh, he was telling, you know, this is something he said, somehow understand and then work out something very different from this kind of a uh, Well, I don't think uh, that needs an answer. That's a good comment. And as I think you've noted all through this, we've talked about research. Let me just say that we, we, we can't do a lot of publicity about this got to be done just quietly and um, we, you know we can't launch out in OM news you know OM teams penetrate Muslim world you know can't it, it, all this old mentality for this work has to go these people are not sent out there by OM 
And, uh, of course, you eventually have to tell them about the church. That's not a problem. And, and what God is doing in other parts of the world. But, uh, it, 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 you see, one of the problems, we always like to have big conferences and big meetings and all agree on what we're going to do. You end up arguing about this until, who knows, because every, everybody has so many different ideas. We are just talking about a few men to go out there and do it. I don't think until a group does this, we have anything to talk about. Unfortunately, we have to talk a little to get things started. And uh, I think you need to understand that a lot of people working in Bangladesh were not really happy about Phil Parcel's book. But that's the way God led him. And, uh, you know, I don't want to judge him for that. So, I, you know, I was caught in between when he wanted me to write, you know, a blurb on the back of it, which I didn't do. But also, I've been slow at some points. I've been slow and I've been hesitant because I also have a lot of old ideas some of which have got to go. And uh, that's not just in this area, I can tell you. So, you know, pray for me because I don't want to lead anybody astray. And believe me, I'm only voicing the thoughts and burdens of many people, even some of you who have talked to me. I'm a sort of spiritual echo chamber. And I like to echo things back that I'm learning. Yes, John Brown. This morning when you were answering a question on follow-up, you said that we must bear in mind that uh, India is a country which got her independence in 1947, and that uh, church planting work should be undertaken by nationals. Now, this afternoon as you're putting forward this uh, new plan of a specialist Muslim team, mm -hmm. you are advocating that the majority of the team could be foreigners. Could you explain why? A beautiful question. Um, I was trying to explain why I didn't feel, I think we were dealing with a tribal issue a bit about that time as well, that as a movement, well, at least that was partly in my mind, as a movement, oh, I'm international, I don't think should get involved with all of our trappings, all the OM trappings, some of which is good, in a massive follow-up area, especially where we know people are going to respond, there are going to be churches within one or two years, and we're just going to be, you know, just way beyond ourselves. Now, I didn't mean to communicate that no missionary could do that work, because that would be wrong. There are missionaries doing that work in already existing denominations, and, you know, who am I to judge them? But OM International, to just start following up everywhere there's response, in India, which is mainly tribals, low caste Hindus, which praise the Lord for. If you think I'm against that, you boy, you're not understanding what I'm saying. We we just don't have all that it takes to, to just suddenly get involved in all that. The ch the church is so developed along that line. She's ready to do that. The church in India is more than ready to do tribal work, bringing outcast Christians into the outcast people into the church. Of course she needs help, and I'm not against missionaries being in that. We will be in it to some degree. But since it's so huge, it's so big, since OM is already going down this road, our work should be to train leaders for that. Now I hear FMPB would like to send us a group of leaders for a year of training. Send them back into that. This area, no one, no group, Indian or non-Indian, has seen a major people's movement or people's movement breakthrough within India. So, you know, I don't think it's going to be too much response, too many people, too much money, endless complications that throw us into chaos. We're talking about a very unique thing. This move is in line with the existing strategy of OM in the Middle East, in line with the Muslim decade of evangelism. That move on the other side, Hindu and tribal side, we, we have no move in that direction. We have no unity internationally for a move in that direction. If you feel strongly that way, you know, just as it's taken me years studying this to get this far, I'm willing to study anything you submit. Yes? It seems to be so far, we, they're not involved in church planting, number one, in India. And secondly, we always watch through the churches 
from your speech that I understand you, first of all, you said you should bypass the church. No, I said parallel. Okay. That word bypass, I'm totally against. And in Bangladesh, we are continuing our PR and our negotiation with the church. They know what we're doing. Some of them are happy. Okay, go ahead. Okay. And the second thing is, um, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we haven't done church planting up to now. So you think you think that you should get involved in church planting. And also you see the kind of things that you're putting forward, it seems to me that we don't have people right now that we can start, even in here at two stands. Wouldn't it be better that we have a team, a group of people who would be interested, working with some group which is already involved in church planting, maybe, maybe with KK Alavi's group. Stay with them, learn a few things and come back. You can send me the research. I don't see anybody in India who's willing to move in this direction at present, or, or, or has moved and seen results. And personally, my own burden at present would not so much be in South India. I think you people have to research South India and bring back information about that. But I think we should start this in North India where we're dealing with a huge language that a lot of people are willing, quite a few people, to learn. Um, now you South Indians, you get your heads together, you research, you can work with K.K. Alavi. You, you're free in that state to do some work with him. Now, here's another thing that's very important. We talk about training people in church planting. What kind of church planting? What kind of church are we going to plant? I feel that, that this is so unique, it's so different, that traditional teaching in church planting will definitely do more harm than good. Definitely. What Phil Bushel doing is so revolutionary. And church planting, as we know it, you and I, is two different planets. Traditional church planting, whatever that means, and I've been trying to figure that out for a long time. I mean, I tell you, in Europe, the, the, the difficulties and the complexities we've got into in our church planting, in, in our efforts, and other people, is quite interesting. And I believe often it's because we try to transfer American church planting to... Austria, or British church planting to some other country. And one of the problems in Europe right now, as I see it, is there's very little people's movement. We've not thought in Europe about how people's movement is important even in our European culture. Yet one of the greatest movements today in Europe is among the gypsies. It's a people's movement. And more research in Europe would show that the history of the church in Europe is linked with people's movements and that perhaps is something we can learn about this even in Europe. So my burden is first of all the language more than church planting methods so you know you can read books. Then the people and their culture of course with that prayer, spiritual life then bringing a team together and then out among these particular people not mainly thinking church planting in a stereotype way, but is there, a, is there a response? You know, until there's any response, we're not going to start many churches. There are no churches really yet in Bangladesh as you would read about in your church planting books. It's, it's too different, too distinct. And uh, churchmanship, I see churchmanship and Christianity as a great enemy to this kind of... A movement. Now let's remember when the people's movement started in the Punjab, the Anglicans were bitterly opposed, quite bitterly opposed to it. Many other, other groups, the thought of bringing these outcasts into the church, it was really the hot controversy. The Presbyterians decided to launch out a radical step. And that led to that breakthrough. And there are some, you may not be in that movement, there are some that believe there could be a people's movement among Muslims. And um, I feel it's worth pushing, praying, and trying, even if the result was only a few individuals to come to the kingdom. The whole thing in Bangladesh could stop. Now, those believers will still be believers, but it may never, may never move. Indonesia, it has. 
you know, we're all just like little children moving, you know, into a big pond. Let's face it, of course, if OM doesn't move in this direction, others will. Wouldn't it be good to give them uh, some of the experience and foundation that we have uh, in helping to pioneer this kind of work? Yes, so many questions. Viv, Thomas, Pradeep, Ray Archer. First, is, is there any other place in the world where this sort of concept is taking place besides Bill Bushel's and Hebel's work in Bangladesh? First of all, it's not just Phil Bushel and Hegel, Hebel, it's a number of other missionaries. It's also the brother Andrew over there, but that's all Bangladesh. There are different leaders who are Muslim converts who tend to believe this way and have seen some breakthroughs. But I don't know of any anything like what we've seen in Bangladesh except Indonesia. Now, Des, could you comment on that? Because maybe other areas, like in Northern Ireland among Roman Catholics, some are trying a more sensitive approach, which parallels what you've been saying. Oh, yeah. Muslims. Oh, yes. Among non-Muslims, this is, well, the others may not know this, among non-Muslims, this is just accepted as the way to go among many missionary leaders. Um, and there's a lot more we could say about that. Just just take a study of the Chinese church. How is the Chinese church growing? They, they, they stay Chinese. And they stay within their own dialect. And they just grow. San Francisco, New York, all over the world. And now they're in OM. And their churches are sending them forth. And of course, an enormous OM has been one of the groups to lead the Chinese church in the cross-cultural evangelism. They have done very little of this. In fact, one of the church growth specialists was in Hong Kong just before I was there. When he said, I directly said the opposite in a number of areas. He said there's no need at present for Chinese people to move outside their own culture because there's so much to do. I would say that to some degree to those of any of you of tribal background. There's no need for you in terms of church planting to move beyond your own culture. There's so much to do. Now, if God gives you a special calling to, to do something else, praise the Lord. That's where I wouldn't agree with McGavin because God has many different ways. I came into Hong Kong and I said, I believe it's time for the Chinese church to send people cross-culturally. Some had already done it. They grabbed this. The same magazine that wrote up the other article wrote up my sermon in print. Now, this was already happening before that, but the Chinese people have discovered how hard this is. There's got to be more specialization, language training, uh, deprogramming and it's going to be a long hard road I feel of course one of the things that OM can provide what can OM provide to this group this kind of group has to have backing just like Bangladesh I have had to back Bangladesh right from the beginning finance you've got to keep a foundation you've got to have a leader everything gets complicated even the simplest church plant so I believe OM subcontinent has some foundation and structure some finance, prayer support to stand behind this specialty work. And I don't agree with people just parachuting and bypassing the church. If this is done, sent out from OM India who has their links in the church, it does not bypass the church. But it becomes a parachurch specialized movement, just like students' movements, and I can give you a hundred other, other movements, for that specialty. So it does not bypass the church, but it goes parallel and it does this to be culturally sensitive and to try to get a breakthrough. That has been happening all over the world, in many, many, many different countries. Even in your big cities. You please do some research in your big cities. Send it to me. Again, I'm a learner. What churches have really grown in the big cities? Has it been the totally intercultural, intergroup churches where, where people of all different cultures and backgrounds come together on the simple common denominator they know English. Please turn your tape over now and continue listening at this point on...
where, where people of all different cultures and backgrounds come together on the simple common denominator they know English. Have those churches really grown? Planted other churches because church growth means they start other churches. Or have the churches grown that have specialized in one particular people's group? Even in Bombay, it seems that some groups that look very interdenominational, interracial, intercultural, you see most of the converts, Roman Catholics. What's their background? So you do some more research because I'm just not wanting to make any finalized opinions. How many Kerala people in Bombay go to totally interdenominational, interracial, intercultural churches? Not many at all. Now I know the, the Fort Assembly was definitely going to be, you know, sort of open to people of all backgrounds, all nationalities. Bill Thompson was one of the elders. First church I ever went to was the Fort Assembly. They're going to reach out to anybody. No respecter of persons, all people's groups. How can we be respecter of persons? Who dominates the Fort Assembly? Now, praise God, there are, there's a smattering of people because it is Bombay. And big cities break down traditional culture. So, in fact, in big cities, you can do almost anything. Really, there's, there's, there's so much breaking down of culture. You've got so many different kinds of people, international marriages, Anglo-Indians. You can do all kinds of things. But most of the people in this section of the world are not living in Bombay. I hope that those of you who live in Bombay will rethink the OM strategy in our church relationships in Bombay and give me some answers. Because, uh, you know, I don't, I don't pretend to be an expert on that. The other question, yeah, second question. I know John Parsons in the Philippines now doing research or something like that. Is he doing a training program? And if he is doing a training program, wouldn't it be wise to send some people there and let's talk to him as relating to India? We would be open to that, definitely. Once we want advice, there's no lack of advice. We got a man across the border here named Hebel, who by God's grace will be here in Kathmandu with us next year. And uh, I think that'll be a lot cheaper than sending all the folks out to the Philippines. Now, they are there in the Philippines to penetrate the Muslim world, the Filipino Muslim. And anything that happens there, we will be monitoring it. And, uh, you know, we're willing for anything. This thing is so impossible. We're not bypassing any option. Because, you know, when you're tackling some, you know, some of us have given 25 years with the Muslim world as our number one target. I've been to Turkey over 25 times. You know, we're not going to bypass any, any options. And if you and your wife would like to go out and study under Phil Parshall, we would really encourage that. Because we know, you know, we all love to go back and think about planting churches in Great Britain, which is really needed, but I'm sure you've seen what a difference it is. In Great Britain, where if just about any, any gospel donkey with a verse can plant a church. <laughs> Don't misunderstand that. You know. This, uh, it's a people's movement. <laughs> this sort, sorting strategy is good, but uh, do you have any thoughts about training if it, God does bring a team together in the next year or two, four or five people in India? Do you suggest any training program within India for two or three months for this team? And another question is, do you have any area right now in your mind that you suggest the team should start? <coughs> there are seven million Muslims in Bihar. <laughs> I have a great burden for the Bihari Muslims. I've walked in their camps every time I go to Bangladesh. And, of course, you know during the partition, and that's another thing I would like a lot of you to do a little more study on, both church history and history of your own country. But as you know, when the partition came, many of the Bihari Muslims ran for their lives. They are a despised, hated people. India does not want them back. Bangladesh does not want them. Pakistan doesn't want them, but now is willing to take some. I've met them in Pakistan. I've met them in the camps in uh, Bangladesh. And I would love to see VR involved in this strategy. Now, let me just say this. I, you know, I know it's a lot grass one time. There can be no going out until there's language, at least enough language to work with. You can continue to learn language when you get out there. Um, and so there's got to be training. And I see a number of possibilities for that. Hopefully Lucknow, maybe Gorakhpur, maybe Ranchi. Team, a specialized team. Live separate. They have to live separate. 
There'll be money for separate accommodation. But there's no problem going over to the Save Alecknell base for lectures and for study. And I, I believe, of course, they've got to immediately go into intensive language study. Yes. Again, all this is subject to your agreement and prayer and endless, endless thoughts. Uh, I don't know if there's somebody else had their hand up before, Ray. Otherwise, Ray, you think you were next. I mean, we're all interested in North India, but I would say that ideal place to begin with would be Kerala. First of all, because we have eight Muslim families who have already come to Christ. We have 200 Muslim contacts who are very interested already. We have men who have dedicated their lives in OM to Muslim evangelism. O.T. John, Teen Korean, Augustine, and at least 10 other men who would be willing, like that, to leave uh, team life, normal team life, and go and live in a village completely away from Christian church and all that. I mean, it's already a, a ready setup. Yeah. They know the language. And these are Muslim, 12 million Muslims right there sitting. I am open to that if there are people willing to pay the price. There is no evidence yet, to any degree, of a people's group that is so totally different from the Muslim people's group making a penetration and planting churches. Individuals, yes. The cleavage between the church in Kerala and the Muslim community is huge. Now, the only thing I can say is I'm out of my depth the moment I talk on this. We've got Korean, right? Let him do some research. Yeah. Well, I haven't seen that. A single report has come back to me. On these other, other areas, we've got whole books. We now have an example of what can be done. Also, um, I, I can't see at present how I can motivate foreigners to go into the most churchy, complicated all right, yeah, state. I'm, let me finish. I can't see how I can send foreigners down to Kerala to that area. I don't have a single foreigner that's even shown an inch of interest in doing that. But if you can do that in your already existing Muslim strategy, which you're launching, you know, I'm not against it. The more different experiments we get going, the better. And, uh, but oh, I would say don't, you know, don't do that and not do something in the north. And preferably, of course, with Muslim converts um, and with some foreigners who are willing to master the language. Now, I do not even begin to know the complexities of the Kerala situation. You, you must... You know, feed me more information. You cannot mix traditional, my view, you cannot mix traditional OM work with this kind of thing. But if, I'm thrilled to be proved wrong, man. I'm, you know, anything. And I'm behind uh, Brother Olivey's work. I've read a little from him. We've got, I've got some of his books I'm taking with me, only they're in Malayalam. I think some of them may be in English, and I'd like to get them. We just published his testimony. How many copies? But, you know, this is a... You know, certain experiments have to be done under certain circumstances. Scientists say if you don't do the experiment under the right environment, the experiment is invalid. I feel that if we take these principles that many men of God are teaching and try them in a, the wrong, a totally wrong context and environment, we can't prove anything. And, and a lot of people have been doing this. They've been trying to do this in, in uh, a number of Middle East countries, Islam in the Middle East is very, very, very different. And in Turkey, Izmir, most of our believers in Izmir are uh, converted Muslim. But we find we cannot mix minority group Christians in these works. Cannot mix them. How many people in Kerala would be willing to go parallel with the church? How can you avoid the church in Kerala in the way that they have in other places? I don't know. You, you, you let me know. And every convert you get, so many different groups, so many different people want them to join. People like our dear brother K.P. Yohanan arriving, big pastor's conferences, big money. The brothers in this kind of work say, all this must be avoided like a plague. One brother in London, 
who was in Muslim work, he found a Muslim convert in India. He grabbed him. He brought him to London. This guy was going to pioneer. I tell you the heartache through that whole thing. I was on the phone, possible court cases, trying to avoid, you know, some of this kind of thing through controlled experimentation in areas that are somewhat away from all of God's chosen so often frozen people. But, you know, you know, let the different flowers bloom. There was another hand. I think I'll take one more question and we need a break. At least I need a break uh, for five minutes and then I'll just bring some closing thoughts. Well, I appreciated your comments and questions. And I think we should leave it now for discussion and prayer, research, language learning. What Mike Weed has said has been very much on my heart. I almost fear to share what's on my heart along that line because it's just the possibilities are without limit. As you know, so much of the church growth, even among the Hindus, is only certain groups. And this vast, neglected people. Um, this is a big, big thing, but, you know, we're really kidding ourselves if we think that uh, OM as a fellowship, at least at this present moment, can just move in so many of those different directions. On the other hand, I believe there are some changes we could make. To even make OM North Indian, OM North India more North Indian. And to, especially when we do have Hindu converts, Try to work with them more carefully and, and uh, with greater wisdom. I don't think it's always best for them to join the team. And my little research of West Bengal lately has shown that some of the growth there is not really that healthy. The young people they leave their families. The heads of families, Brother Mullick told me this. Maybe he's wrong. Everything has complications. Not so many whole families following Christ. And we're not against individuals coming to Christ. Don't misunderstand it. A lot of our work is still that way. That's the traditional work. I'm still committed to that. But let's not close the door to seeing people come to Christ, maybe go a little slow in some areas. Here's a young person come to Christ. With the right teaching, he can win his family. One case, a whole people's group might have responded if the person would have abstained from eating with the foreigners. He ate with the foreigners or another people's group too quickly. So no longer, because of his culture, could he eat anymore with his own. See, eating with people in some cultures is very big. And we, in some of our follow-up, we actually just rip people out of their culture. Make them little convert movie stars overnight, and we meet them in Amsterdam. They never see a response in their people's group. They become Christian freaks, some of them. Now, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for such people. I'm a freak. I'm an international freak. I never had a people's movement in my own home area. Even my relatives, they're not come to Christ. No, I, you know, I'm not bitter about that. A beautiful thing we have represented in this room is the Vakram, converted in the individual one-by-one -one method. Unique story, testimony written. But he went back to his family with great sensitivity. And he won. Did you get your whole family or part of your family? Mother. Mother. Christ, that took a lot of patience, didn't it? Yeah. Now, that's an example. And, of course, don't think I'm pushing one little root. You know, I'm a great believer in the providence of God. But some of these West Bengal people who joined us when they were so young, maybe they should have been left at home and said, look, you need to demonstrate with your life and other things about this faith. I don't know enough about West Bengal to lecture on that subject. But I do feel that there are some possible breakthroughs ahead in India in new people's groups by people who are more culturally sensitive, put more emphasis on language, and are willing to separate themselves for a season from the, the, the gospel ragtime band uh, that sometimes we tend to represent. We have transplanted a lot of South Indian culture into North India. Drive around North India, everywhere I go, Kerala coffee houses. I don't know if they're still there. Each person goes to their own cultural enclave. We still speak our own language among ourselves. We'll still only marry our own kind. 
Now that's good for a people's group movement within your own people. But when you go cross-cultural, you must be ready, perhaps, to marry cross-culturally. That has sometimes brought major breakthroughs in some movements. One of the men I met doing really sound Islamic work over in Pakistan, he's actually married to an American. He may be better, better married to an American. That's his second wife. His first Pakistani wife died. She is committed to Islam than married to a woman who will have no dealings with any of that kind of thing. So it's complicated. And with every answer, we might create some problems. Now, if we are going to train people for church planting, OM can't do all this with all the new people we receive, but if we are going to train people for church planting, for penetrating the unreached peoples, we need to at least have a course in cultural sensitivity, cross-cultural communication. We need to have language. I was surprised to discover that in Lucknow we have no language program. I couldn't understand that. Now, forgive me, I have only been the area leader here for one year. I'm just, I've stood back in, in, in Bombay all these years just hanging on for survival. I just said, whatever you guys agree on, do it. But I would suggest that language learning in general be made a much higher priority in the whole India work. And let's be honest, a lot of our guys that come out on there can learn any language. They're lazy. They're lazy. You've got to have a diligent mind. They can't even get through the gospel packet program. They can't even get through the Mickey Mouse study program. We have got to get people who really are committed to this. You see, if men don't have this as a deep calling, they won't make it. They will not make it. We've seen guys go to learn Turkish and just bounce out of there like rubber balls off bronze. We've seen guys go to learn Arabic. We've seen Mickey Walker had a brew. He just was real honest. Can't do it. Forget it. <laughs> you know? Roger Atkins admitted to me, if he doesn't see a breakthrough in Bengali, he's a key man now in Bangladesh, he'll just take it from the Lord. He can't do it. So, you know, it's not just everybody. It's not this mass recruiting that's going on of missionaries in the South for North India. Without balance, intensive training, a lot of other ingredients. It's good for distribution, but they don't want to do distribution. They're all talking about church planting. They're all talking about all kinds of things. They often don't know what they're even talking about. And we're just going to transplant a lot of things that are going to be ultimately uh, not successful in breaking through, at least among Muslims, and probably not to any great degree among Hindus. Let's take a